one area of geophysics that gets little attention for its degree of importance is the recession of the moon. Yes, the moon is slowly moving further away from the Earth, and it is slowing the Earth's rotation in the process. This was first discovered following the Apollo moon landing by bouncing lasers off of reflectors left behind by the astronauts. The reflectors were designed to accurately measure the Earth-Moon distance. The measurement showed that the moon is getting further away at a rate of 1.5 inches or 3.82 centimeters per year. Furthermore, a day is getting longer by 1.7 milliseconds per day per century. Both effects are a result of tidal forces between the Earth and the moon, and these are the same forces that are responsible for the high and low tides experienced twice a day. Lunar recession has been used as evidence against the old Earth model for several decades now. Those claiming the old Earth have made an effort to respond to these calculations. Some have been a challenge, while others have been pathetic. The pathetic efforts generally involve projecting current rate back in a linear fashion with no regard to the actual forces involved. This naturally fails because gravity is not linear. More challenging efforts involve complex calculations involving the effect of continental positions on the tide. What follows is the result of an objective study on whether or not lunar recession is a limiting factor on the age of the Earth, and whether or not it is compatible with the claim that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. One way in which this study is different from most previous ones is that it only considers the forces acting on the two bodies. Most other studies simplify the calculations by assuming that angular momentum is conserved in the Earth's moon system. This study considers the possibility that some angular momentum could be lost from the Earth by other means such as frictional heating or other factors. The results show exactly what it would take for lunar recessions to have been going on for 4.5 billion years, as well as whether or not it agrees with other data. Warning, the next six sections contain a lot of math. If you do not think you will understand it, feel free to go to the short version that does not have the math. The math is needed to set the background on which the material is based, and it is for those that can understand it. Tides occur because the gravitational force exerted by one body on another changes with the distance between them. As a result of this, and the fact that physical objects are not points but are extended over a volume, different parts of an object will experience different gravitational forces. Because plants are not absolutely rigid, these differences produce a small bulge facing the object and one of equal size on the opposite side of the planet. The pull of the moon's gravity on the center of the Earth is proportional to 1 over r squared, where r is the distance between the center of the moon and the center of the Earth. The pull of the moon's gravity on the Earth's tidal bulge is proportional to 1 over capital R minus little r squared, where little r is the radius of the Earth. The difference between the two is proportional to the following formula. Now, the mass of the tidal bulge would be proportional to this difference resulting in the following formula. The mass of the tidal bulge would be proportionally higher simply because the size of the tidal bulge would be proportionally bigger. This is because the closer the moon gets to the Earth, the stronger the gravitational forces between them become. The key element in tidal geometry is the phase angle theta, which is the angle that results from the delay of the mass in the tidal bulge reacting to the gravitational pull of the moon. This delay causes high tides to be slowly ahead of the moon since the Earth rotates faster than the moon orbits the Earth. If, on the other hand, the moon orbited faster than the Earth rotated, then theta would be negative. If the moon orbited at the same rate as the Earth's rotation, then theta would equal zero. The tidal phase angle theta is proportional to the difference in the angular velocity of the Earth's rotation and the angular velocity of the moon's orbit. Now, it is possible that as the moon gets closer and the size and mass of the tidal bulge gets bigger, that the reaction time would actually get longer. But this would only increase theta, reducing the time over which lunar recession can have been going on. The angle of the opposite bulge, theta prime, is exactly half a circle behind theta. Here is the formula for the angular velocity of the moon in its orbit in relationship to the distance between the Earth and the moon and the linear velocity of the moon in its orbit. Here is the formula for the angular velocity of the Earth's rotation in relationship to the radius of the Earth and the linear velocity of the Earth's rotation at its surface. This is the formula for the distance between the moon and Earth's moon-facing tidal bulge. This is the formula for the distance between the moon and Earth's opposite tidal bulge. Here we take the formula for the distance between the moon and Earth's opposite tidal bulge and put it in terms of theta. 
here we have the final formula for the distances between the moon and each of Earth's tidal bulges. Here we have the formula for the angle between the distance between the Earth and the moon and the distance between the moon and Earth's moon facing tidal bulge. Here we have the formula for the angle between the distance between the moon and the Earth and the distance between the moon and Earth's opposite tidal bulge. Here we have the formula for the angle between the distance between the moon and the Earth facing tidal bulge and the radius of the Earth at the tidal bulge. Here we have the angle between the distance from the moon to Earth's opposite tidal bulge and the radius of the Earth at the tidal bulge. Here we take the angle between the distance between the moon and Earth's opposite tidal bulge and the radius of the Earth at that tidal bulge in terms of the angle theta. At this point, we have the full geometry of tidal interactions, not only between the Earth and the Moon, but for any two bodies. However, the case before us is about the Earth-Moon system, and these calculations are set up specifically to analyze that system. Here we have the forces that result on the Moon from the Earth's tidal bulges. These forces are the gravitational forces of the Earth as a whole, as well as both tidal bulges. Being gravitational forces, they all get exponentially larger as the moon gets closer to the Earth. This is the formula for the gravitational force between the entire Earth and the moon. This is the formula for the gravitational force between the Earth near tidal bulge and the moon. Here is the formula for the gravitational force between the Earth far tidal bulge and the moon. Now it needs to be noted that the values of both r prime and r double prime are dependent on the value of the tidal phase angle theta. This means that theta is a critical factor in determining both g prime and g delta prime. In fact, theta is the most critical factor of lunar recession. This is the formula for the force applied to the moon by the Earth's near tidal bulge along its orbit, causing the moon to accelerate and spiral out. This is actually stronger than the observed net force, but it is countered in part by a smaller force from the Earth's far tidal bulge. In the above formula, alpha is the angle between r prime and r. This is the formula for the force applied to the moon by the Earth's far tidal bulge along its orbit, causing the moon to decelerate. It is smaller than the force from the Earth's near tidal bulge, and counters in part the larger force from the Earth's near tidal bulge. This is because the far tidal bulge is farther from the moon than the near tidal bulge. In the above formula, beta is the angle between r double prime and r. This formula gives the net force on the moon along its orbit, causing the moon to accelerate and slowly spiral outward. Furthermore, since both alpha and beta are related to theta, theta is shown to be even more important. This is the formula for the torque applied to the moon by the net tidal force. This is the formula for the moon's moment of inertia in its orbit. And this is the rate of change in the moon's angular velocity. This set of formulas derives the relationship between the moon's angular velocity and the radius of its orbit, all leading to the final formula that gives us the relationship between the moon's angular velocity and the radius of its orbit. We use this formula to get the moon's angular velocity from the radius of its orbit, and we use this formula to get the radius of the moon's orbit from its angular velocity. Here we have the forces that result on the Earth's tidal bulge from the moon. These forces are the gravitational forces that act on the Earth as a whole, as well as both tidal bulges. Being gravitational forces, all three get exponentially larger as the moon gets closer to the Earth. This is the formula for the gravitational force between the entire Earth and the moon. This is the formula for the gravitational force between the Earth near tidal bulge and the moon. Here is the formula for the gravitational force between the Earth's far tidal bulge and the moon. Now it needs to be noted that the values of both r prime and r double prime are dependent on the value of the tidal phase angle theta. This means that theta is a critical factor in determining both g prime and g double prime. In fact, theta is the most critical factor of lunar recession. Sigma is the angle between the radial force on the near tidal bulge and g prime. Sigma prime is the angle between the radial force on the far tidal bulge and g double prime. This is the force applied to the Earth near tidal bulge by the moon along the rotation of the Earth. It is actually stronger than the observed net force because it's countered in part by a smaller force between the moon and Earth's far tidal bulge.
This is the force applied to the Earth's far tidal bulb by the Moon along the rotation of the Earth. It is smaller than the force between the Moon and the Earth's near tidal bulb and counters in part that larger force. This is because the far tidal bulb is farther from the Moon than the near tidal bulb. This formula gives the net force on the Earth along its rotational axis, causing the Earth's rotation to slow. Since both sigma and sigma prime are related to theta, theta is shown to be even more important. This is the torque applied to the Earth from the net tidal force. If the Earth were a perfect solid sphere, its moment of inertia would be IE equals 2 fifths mv r squared. However, the Earth is not a perfect solid sphere, so the above moment of inertia produces a slowing rate of 5.28 milliseconds per century. However, the correct value is 2.3 milliseconds per century. So correcting the error requires multiplying the above moment of inertia by 5.28 divided by 2.3, which gives us the new formula for the Earth's moment of inertia of IE equals 10.56 divided by 11.5 ME over R squared. This produces the following formula for the slowing of the Earth's rotation. The following are measured quantities. The mass of the moon is 7.3477 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. The radius of the moon's orbit is 384,399,000 meters. The rate of change in the distance of the moon from the Earth is 3.84 centimeters per year, or 0.0384 meters per year. The mass of the Earth is 5.9742 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The radius of the Earth is 6,371,000 meters. The angular momentum of the Earth is 7.29115 times 10 to the negative 5th second, with the rate of change in the Earth's rotation being 1.7 milliseconds per day per century, or 4.5 six two one five times ten to the negative twenty two per second squared. High tide lies twelve minutes behind the moon. This yields a phase angle theta of three degrees. The average ocean tide height is one point six feet or roughly half a meter. The largest tsunami ever recorded is seventeen hundred and twenty feet or five hundred and twenty four meters and the gravitational constant equals six point six seven three times ten to the minus eleven meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. For initial calculated quantities, we first recall the following from the section on the forces on the moon. Combining these results results in the formula for K zero at the bottom and the formula for the mass of each of Earth's tidal bulges as seen at the bottom the net tidal force is on the moon. You notice Ft is calculated by converting the lunar recession rate to the change in the moon's angular velocity. This can be done with the formulae provided in the section on the forces on the moon. The mass of the Earth's tidal bulge is related to the difference between the Earth's center and the moon and the distance between the Earth's surface nearest the moon and the moon. This results in the following relationship. There are several limiting factors on the Earth moon system. The first is theta being greater than one half pi. If theta is greater than one half pi, then the Earth's rotation would accelerate and it would never drop below or even reach theta equals one half pi. With theta less than one half pi, then the Earth's rotation slows and it can never get above or even reach theta equals one half pi. The Earth's rotational velocity must be less than orbital velocity of about four and a half miles per second. That's a rotation period of one and a half hours. If the Earth's surface rotational velocity were greater than or equal to orbital velocity, then it could not form by collapse by natural means. Furthermore, if the Earth's surface rotational velocity were greater than orbital velocity, then the outward stress on the planet would eventually tear it apart. The Moon's orbital radius must be greater than the Earth's verge limit for the Moon, which is 9,496 kilometers. If the Moon's orbital radius were less than the verge limit, then the Moon would be torn apart, nor could it have formed within the verge limit. As a result, its orbital radius had to have been more than the verge limit. The Moon's orbital radius at time t must be greater than geostationary orbital radius at time t. 
If the moon's orbital radius were less than the geostationary orbital radius, then it would spiral inward towards the Earth and not away from it. If the moon's orbital radius were equal to geostationary orbital radius, then the Earth and moon would be totally lost and no change would occur. Note that with a faster rotation rate, the geostationary orbital radius would be smaller and could at some time in the past be less than the road limit. The following section shows four backward projections of lunar recession data based on four different conditions. The first is a straightforward backwards projection with no tweaks. The other projections were made to deal with common mistakes made on the issue. Sometimes these mistakes are made by accident, but other times they are made to hide problems this data makes for a four and a half billion year old Earth. This is a straightforward backward projection of the relative proper secular breaking of the Earth's rotation and lunar recession data, made without any tweaks. The current data is simply plugged into the math as shown earlier. The result is that the moon would have been locked in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth at 14,000 kilometers, 1.171 billion years ago. This is far short of the 4.5 billion years commonly given for the age of the Earth. This suggests that the Earth moon system cannot be anywhere near 4.5 billion years old. These results are similar to other calculations done by others showing that these calculations are valid. This is a backwards projection of the relative proper secular breaking of the Earth's rotation in lunar recession data made assuming that the current relative proper secular acceleration of the Earth's rotation continued back. The relative proper acceleration is the difference between the relative proper secular breaking and the observed net breaking of the Earth's rotation. The reason given for the difference is the process of the Earth rounding out following the ice age. Once again, the current data is simply plugged into the map as shown earlier. The result is that the moon would have been lost in geocircuit orbit around the Earth 1.25 billion years ago. This is far short of the four and a half billion years commonly given for the age of the Earth, suggesting that the Earth moon system cannot be anywhere near four and a half billion years old. This is a backwards projection of the number of days in a year in lunar recession data, made assuming a constant breaking of the Earth's rotation. This is not a reasonable assumption, but it is a common mistake. The result is that the moon would have been locked in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth 3.36 billion years ago. So even this extremely generous assumption produces a result that is far short of the 4.5 billion years commonly given to the years of the Earth, suggesting that the Earth moon system cannot be anywhere near 4.5 billion years old. This is a backwards projection of the number of days in a year in lunar recession data made assuming the Earth's rotation is constant. Now this is not a reasonable assumption, in fact it is totally contrary to observation. The result is that the moon would have been locked in geocircuit orbit around the Earth 1.55 billion years ago at 42,164 kilometers. So even this extremely generous assumption produces a result that is far short of the 4.5 billion years commonly given to the years of the Earth, suggesting that the Earth moon system cannot be anywhere near 4.5 billion years old. These backward positions show that the forces on the moon are far more important than those on the Earth in determining the maximum age for the Earth moon system. The fact that you do not even get halfway to 4.5 billion years, even when keeping the Earth's rotation rate constant, is strong evidence for the Earth-Moon system not being anywhere near 4.5 billion years old. We could potentially stop here, but several arguments have been raised against such conclusions, and we need to deal with those arguments. All those proponents often point to pantological data as evidence that the previous backward projections are wrong. The claim will often include a few examples that are often dated as millions of years apart. However, this claim does not consider all of the facts about this data, including alternative interpretations that do not have anything to do with lunar recession and the length of an Earth day. This pentological data comes in the form of fossil bivalve and coral, fossil somalite, and fossil tidal rhythmite. Bivalves and coral are animals that tend to live about a year and show daily growth rings on their hard exterior. Stromalites are produced by the activities of fine metal bacteria. Tidal rhythmites are produced by tidal action. Stromalites are produced by the activity of cyanobacteria. The living colonies produce 365 layers in a year. Fossil colonies have been found with 450 to 800 layers in apparent agreement with the slowing of the Earth's rotation to geologic ages. The main problem is that 
fossil stromalites may not have formed from cyanobacteria. Some contain no evidence of the cyanobacteria, and carbonate precipitation can result in some very stromalite-like structures, rendering the number of layers meaningless. However, even if they are legitimate fossil stromalites, it could just mean that the colonies lived longer than a year in the past. Pyrrhythmites are produced by tidal action. So-called fossil pyrrhythmites are assumed to indicate the moon's position in the number of days in a month or year in the past. Now, getting data out of rock patterns is not a simple process. It is based on the fact that there are two high tides in a day, and that it changes every month from different positions of the moon. Figuring out the number of days in a month or year in the past requires comparing patterns in the rocks with patterns expected to be produced by the moon. The main problem with this is that it requires making assumptions about where the moon was at the time, resulting in a degree of circular reasoning. In addition, there are factors that distort tidal rhythms that can produce erroneous patterns. There is also an additional problem since the same types of patterns occur in barbs. The question is whether or not these are rhythmites or barbs. It turns out that even experts have a hard time telling them apart in the geologic record. If they are barbs, then the patterns are meaningless for determining past lunar position or the number of days in the year. Coral barb rocks normally produce one growth ring per day, producing 265. Due to the slow of the Earth's rotation, coral would have more rings in the past on an old Earth. Fossil coral and bar valves have been found with 357 to 450 growth rings. The extra growth rings are assumed to indicate more days per year. However, they could mean that these coral and bar valves live more than a year. Furthermore, in some cases, what are being examined are monthly growth rings, with the number of days in a year being calculated based on an assumption of more than 12 shorter lunar months. In those cases, it is assumed that both days and lunar months were shorter, making it certainly reason to use as evidence for the same. All of these are interpreted as showing more days in a year in the past. However, when one looks closely at this data, the claim is shown not to be so certain. The first clue is in the degree of scattering in the data. It is not what would be expected if it really were the result of lunar recession. It should produce a clear curve, like seen here, but it does not. Now, scattering often occurs in data, but in this case, there is no reason for this degree of scattering. If it were a clearer line with a little scattering, then the scattering could be early death. However, the actual degree of scattering does not indicate this. From a creation science perspective, the scattering of the fossil bivalves and coral could be a result of hydrological sorting during the flood. Those with more growth rings would be larger and thereby end up very lower. And the scattering results from hydrological sorting being an imperfect process. The similite data shows four pairs of data points. The older pairs could be pre-flood and may have been formed during the creation year, while the other two seem to be an early flood deposit. The relationship in each pier shows no trend. However, there is a trend among the pairs, and in particular among the three older pairs. This could simply represent a change in precipitation patterns. The basic assumption of this data that makes it meaningful to lunar recession is the date. If the dates are wrong and these fossils and features were a result of the Genesis flood or a recreation, then the data would not be expected to fit a lunar recession model consistent with a four and a half billion year old Earth. From an old Earth point of view, the data represents real data on the slowing of the Earth's rotation. Thus, any viable old Earth model needs to fit this data. If an old Earth model does not fit this paleontological data, it is a field model. Naturally, old Earth proponents try to defend their four and a half billion year age for the Earth from the laws of physics. Most responses to the lunar recession issues found on anti-creationist websites are little more than copy and paste jobs from a main anti-creation website. One argument used to save the old Earth model is that continental location affects tidal drag. While this is true, since the closer the moon is, the stronger its pull on the Earth, the rate of change tends to get very large. The result is that to save the old Earth model, it becomes necessary to virtually eliminate the effect of the continents. Eugene Polico's paper, Numerical Modeling of the Paleotidal Evolution of the Earth-Moon System, is an effort to calculate the effect of continental movement based on actual estimates of past continental movement. 
Because of the limitations of the methods used to estimate past continental movement, it only projects back 600 million years, but this is enough to evaluate the results. This is a chart showing the results of this study. You have the number of years into the past, the change in the distance of the moon, and the change in the length of the Earth's day. The way to judge the validity of a mathematical model is to see how well it reproduces known data. Polico's calculations give a figure of 2.91 centimeters per year as the moon's current recession rate and 1.59 seconds per year per century as the rate of slowing of the Earth's rotation. The problem with these figures is that they both differ significantly from the values actually observed. The moon's current recession rate has actually been measured at 3.82 centimeters per year which is nearly a third larger than Poleco's model indicates. Furthermore, the slowing of the Earth's rotation has been measured at 0.8812 seconds per year per century, which is 55% of what Poleco's model indicates. At first glance, the fact that Poleco's model overestimates the deceleration rate of the Earth's rotation would seem to be a plus. But limiting factors of the age of the Earth-Moon system is in the position of the Moon, not the Earth's rotation rate. Since the Moon's recession rate is actually higher in Palico's model, the error would be a clear negative. The real problem is that the discrepancies between the model and real-world data show there to be a fundamental flaw in the model. It means that Palico overlooked one or more major factors that could easily nullify his results. As you can see here, his model falls well below much of the paleontological data. The final flaw in this model is that it does not produce results consistent with paleontological evidence. Any old Earth model for the evolution of the Earth-Moon system would have to agree with both present system and paleontological evidence, but Palico's model disagrees with both. Next we have a paper published by Kirk Hansen called Secular Effects of Oceanic Tide Dissipation on the Moon's Orbit and the Earth's Rotation. The main argument is based on the notion that in the past, the phase angle between Earth's lunar tidal bulge and the Moon was smaller than the current 3 degrees. In the abstract of his paper, Hasten states that past calculations leading to 1 to 2 billion years maximum age for the Earth-Moon system assume a constant frictional phase lag angle. To reduce the phase angle, he claims that the current continental position has produced an unusually high phase angle. He further proposes that when there was a single continent, the phase angle was smaller than today. However, subsequent calculations, including this one, make no such assumption, showing that the phase angle is a function of the rotation rate of the Earth and the orbital rate of the Moon. The result is a tendency for it to be higher in the past unless the Moon is near geosynchronous orbit. The conclusion given is that the Moon started at a distance of 151,000 miles with a 12-hour day on Earth, though often the 12-hour day is omitted. However, when this claim is studied more closely, it does not work without specific tweaking to get the current Earth-Moon system from the starting conditions. A preliminary backwards calculation shows that a phase angle of less than one degree is needed for most of the Earth's history for the Earth-Moon system to be 4.5 billion years old. In this backwards calculation, no geographic basis is used to get the one degree phase angle. It is just what is mathematically necessary to save the 4.5 billion year figure from the laws of celestial mechanics. In this case, a 1 degree phase angle was used to project the number of days in a year backwards. When compared with old Earth paleontological data, it falls far short of that data. It shows that such a slow slowing of the Earth's rotation is not workable. Simply put, it does not agree with other data that it must agree with to be correct. Now when the starting conditions of this claim are put into the math, along with a phase angle that would result in today's lunar distance, the number of 
hours in a day at present comes to 26.44 hours. This is above the present day value of 24 hours. It produces a number of days in a year that is totally below the paleontological data. This is so bad that it even goes below a fossil indicating just 350 days. In an effort to be as fair as possible, I added a fudge factor to the Earth's rotation rate so as to get it in line with the observed present value. This fudge factor was originally designed to deal with the current relative proper secular acceleration of the Earth's rotation, which is thought to result from the Earth's rounding out following the Ice Age. However, since this fudge factor is a percentage of the torque on the Earth from the Moon that actually slows the Earth's rotation, it can hence substitute for any unknown factor that reduces the slowing of the Earth's rotation without acting on the Moon. The phase angle was adjusted to 0 0.39 degrees and the fudge factor was set at 91.5%. There is no known geological basis for this fudge factor. It is simply required to make the model fit reality. By making these adjustments, we once again get today's lunar distance. We also managed to get a 24-hour day. The projection of the number of days in a year still falls far short of the old Earth paleontological data. This model fails this critical test as well. It gets worse for this model since it starts with 729 days in a year. This is actually less than at least two of the old Earth paleontological data points. However, the final nail in this model's coffin is that it runs afoul of the currently accepted and presented as truth theory of the moon's origin. According to this now currently accepted model, the moon resulted from an impact between the Earth and a Mars-sized planet about four and a half billion years ago. It also has the moon forming at one-tenth the distance from the Earth as the model we have been examining. As a result, this attempt to save the 4.5 billion year figure from the laws of celestial mechanics fails every test that can be thrown at it. The giant collision hypothesis of the origin of the moon proposes that the moon formed as a result of a collision between the Earth and a Mars sized body referred to as Theia. This is the latest in a long line of theories, and it will probably be taught in schools as fast, only to be replaced in a few decades by a new theory that will be taught as fast. One evolution has illustrated the difficulty they have in explaining the moon by purely natural means by jokingly saying that the best explanation for the moon is observational error. As shown here, Theia formed at Earth's L5 point with the sun and eventually drifted into an impact. The L5 point is one of five points between the Earth and the sun where a small body can have a relatively stationary position with respect to the Earth and the sun. The moon is thought to have formed after the impact with the hypothetical protoplanet Thea. The name Thea comes from Greek mythology and is the name of the Titan goddess who was the mother of the moon goddess, Selene. The question before us is, can you get the current Earth-Moon system from this in a manner consistent with the observed data? What follows is an analysis of the receding of the moon and slowing of the Earth's rotation to test the feasibility of this model with regards to the laws of celestial mechanics. These results are then compared to old Earth proponents' own paleontological data to see if they fit. This model has a set of starting conditions for the Earth-Moon system, resulting from the hypothetical impact. The model has a five-hour day on Earth when the Moon forms. It further starts with the Moon just 14,000 miles from Earth. These starting conditions allow us to calculate this model forward to the present to see how it fits reality. The first calculation of this model simply involved plugging the starting conditions into the simulator with no fudge factors. It produced an initial phase angle, theta, of 6.93 degrees, which is more than twice the current value of 3 degrees. The result was a present Earth day of 44.9 hours and a lunar distance of 440,476 kilometers, both of which are significantly larger than their current values.
The next forward calculation of this model plugs the starting conditions into the simulator, but force a phase angle of 0.99 degrees and an additional fudge factor of 94.3% of the torque of the moon actually applied to slowing the Earth's rotation. The additional factors were not based on any geological or other factor that would suggest it, but was simply what was required to get the current Earth-Moon system from the starting condition. Now this simulation did produce the current Earth-Moon system, but only by tweaking two factors to the simulation specifically to get that result. However, the projection of the number of days a year falls far short of all the Earth proponents' own paleontological data. As a result, the giant collision hypothesis of the origin of the moon fails the reality test. Yes, if tweaked just right, you can get the current Earth-Moon system, but it does not fit other data. The giant collision hypothesis of the origin of the moon does not naturally produce the current Earth-Moon system. It only works by deliberately tweaking the phase angle and the percentage of torque from the moon that is actually applied to the slowing of the Earth's rotation rate to do so. There is no scientific basis for this tweaking other than forcing the simulation to produce the current Earth-Moon system. Furthermore, it does not fit the paleontological data from old Earth proponents' own theoretical system of geology, thus this model fails. In an effort to be thorough and to give the 4.5 billion year figure every possible chance, a simulation was run specifically so as to match the paleontological data. However, the results only make matters worse for the 4.5 billion year figure because it not only fails to save the figure, but it actually raises more problems for it. Here is a backwards projection for the number of days in a year as compared to the old Earth paleontological data. This fits the data, but it happens by artificially adjusting the phase angle theta. This is done specifically to fit this data and not based on any actual geological basis. It is done by changing the phase angle to these percentages at specific times in the simulation as produced in this graph. And let's take a look at the moon's distance from the Earth. When we look at the backwards projection of the moon's distance from the Earth, it is found to be at the Roche limit about 2.067 billion years ago. This once again indicates that the Earth-Moon system cannot be 4.5 billion years old. The moon just moves too quickly to get the current Earth-Moon system by any realistic means by starting 4.5 billion years ago. Finally, to allow it to reach the 4.5 billion years required adding an additional phase angle adjustment to 0.92% in the simulation at 1.975 billion years. The result was to reduce the phase angle to 0.06 to 0.1 degrees. Like before, this was done for no other reason than to make it reach the 4.5 billion year mark. The fact that it takes unrealistic phase angles to reach this result is enough to invalidate the 4.5 billion year figure. However, beyond 4.26 billion years ago, the phase angle becomes totally impossible since the moon's gravity is not strong enough to pull anything the required distance that fast. Furthermore, based on the observed current value of 3 degrees, it is probably physically impossible for the Earth and its oceans to react to the moon's gravity quickly enough for the needed phase angle of one-tenth of a degree or less. As a result, even this last-ditch effort to salvage the 4.5 billion year figure fails. The conclusion of this study on lunar recession, tides, and the age of the Earth is that there is no legitimate model of lunar recession that fits a 4.5 billion year old Earth. The simple fact is that lunar recession limits the age of the Earth to way less than 4.5 billion years. True, it does not prove the Earth is 6 to 7 thousand years old, but it proves beyond a reasonable doubt that it is considerably younger than 4.5 billion years. Old Earth proponents clearly understand that they have a problem here, since their ultimate response seems to be that the Earth-Moon system is too complicated to get an accurate result from such calculations. Even if this is true, this study went to every length fit the model to data so as to get accurate results 
and it still shows the Earth Moon system can't be four and a half billion years old. So even in their efforts to rebut the lunar recession age limit, they only show that it is a problem for them. Now this does not prove beyond any doubt that the Earth Moon system can't be four and a half billion years old. After all, you can never prove anything beyond an unreasonable doubt. However, believing that the Earth Moon system is four and a half billion years old requires an act of faith that there is a solution out there someplace that has yet to be discovered.